Warfarin is one of the most commonly prescribed drugs in the world and is one of the longest serving anticoagulants in medicine. Its history all started in the US and Canada during the 1920s. While for many in the US, the 1920s roared along producing advances in technology, mass consumerism and a high standard of living. For many millions of other Americans, including farmers, life was not so good. Farming suffered a depression in the early years of the decade and for many, this lasted through to the end of the 1930s. Exports to a war-torn Europe ceased and the price of wheat fell. During the 1920s, more than half a million farmers went bankrupt, with many more hanging on in extreme rural poverty. To add insult to injury, by the early 1920s, American and Canadian cattle were mysteriously falling over and dying. A number of wet summers had produced mouldy hay, which would normally have been destroyed but was being kept as animal feed. In 1922, a veterinary scientist, originally from England but living in Ontario, Frank Schofield, made the link between the dying cattle and their feed. The hay contained sweet clovers, and when the clovers got wet and started to rot, the moulds, Penicillium nigrans and Penicillium gentii, proliferated. The condition became known as sweet clover disease. Then, in 1929, Lee Roderick, a scientist at the Agricultural Experimental Station of North Dakota, made the link between coumarin with a lack of prothrombin, a clotting factor in the bud, so isolating the cause of the internal bleeding. The next piece of the puzzle was solved by Carl Link and his senior research student Wilhelm Schoeffel. In an article in the British Journal of Haematology, Wardrop and Keeling recounted the story of how, during a blizzard, Ed Carlson, a local Wisconsin farmer who had lost many of his herd to the sweet clover disease, drove up to the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, presented Link with a can of uncoagulated blood, a pile of rotting hay, and dumped a dead, half-frozen cow in the laboratory. All that Link and Scherfel could advise was to feed better quality hay to the cattle. But at Scherfel's insistence, the pair investigated further, and six years later, they are able to isolate the active compound, dicumarol. The moulds in the hay were oxidising coumarin, which is the chemical responsible for the smell of new mown grass, into dicumarol, and this was causing internal bleeding and the subsequent death of the cattle. As the story goes, Link had the idea of using dicumarol first of all as a rat poison whilst he was recuperating from a lung infection in a sanatorium with a rat infestation. Although he thought that dicumarol's action was too slow, so his team developed about 150 analogues of the chemical. The one that proved strongest in its anticoagulation action, 3-phenylacetyl-ethyl-4-hydroxycoumarin, was developed as coumadin or warfarin as we now know it. Named after the, the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, WARF, it was marketed as a rat poison in 1948, although Link believed it was too strong for use in humans at that time. Within about 10 years of appearing as a rodenticide, rats started to become resistant to warfarin, and this led to the development of so-called superwarfarins. Humans too sometimes developed warfarin resistance, particularly after having large doses of vitamin K to reverse anticoagulant therapy. It was this discovery of the link with vitamin K that made the leap between rat poison and a therapeutic use for humans possible. As well as being a very personal medicine, warfarin is also implicated with the health of two world leaders. On one side of the Atlantic, the American president Dwight D. Eisenhower was prescribed warfarin in 1955 after suffering a heart attack. The president's health status was, and is, a very sensitive issue, and there was a lot of controversy about whether doctors misdiagnosed Eisenhower's condition, or whether it was simply understated for economic and political reasons. However, the president's use of warfarin popularised the medication for human use, even if patients and doctors still referred to it as rat poison. But on the other side of the world, a very different scenario played out, reminding us that what can cure can kill. One of the enduring conspiracy theories of the mid-20th century suggests that Joseph Stalin, the Russian dictator, was poisoned, probably by one of his inner circle. While he was 73 at the time of his death in 1953, and in poor health, it has long been suspected that he was poisoned. 
The official cause of death was a stroke, according to the autopsy findings, released 60 years later. In an article for Surgery Neurology International, Miguel Faria suggests that while the autopsy findings confirm the diagnosis made by Stalin's doctors, that they wrote the autopsy in such a way as to leave clues to what they thought had happened. While Stalin did suffer a hypertensive cerebral hemorrhage and stroke, as the autopsy confirmed, other symptoms were unnatural. A bleeding stomach, vomiting blood and bleeding affecting the heart are not usual with a stroke. It has been suggested that warfarin, which is a clear, crystalline, tasteless chemical, could have been administered by one of his inner circle. Whether Stalin was poisoned or not, we may never be sure, but warfarin, correctly administered, has benefited millions of people through the 20th century and continues to be the anticoagulant of choice in the 21st century.